what we do. So everything that human, humans make is technically technology. So I'm going to, and we have a different meaning for technology, so I'm going to change. The Greek root of technology is techni. Techni means whatever human make, humans make. So I'm just call it the arts here. And in the arts we have tinkering. I'm going to do these in historical order. So mammals are creatures who tinker, especially primates, especially us. And engineering is a kind of principled tinkering. So it came before math and science. What does it mean by principled if you don't have math and science? Well, if you build a building and it falls down, uh, you just build it with twice the cross sections of all the beams. You don't need any math and science for that. If it doesn't fall down, you write it down in a book and you wind up with this big cookbook. That, by the way, is the way Babylonians did math. The Greeks hated long books of things like that. That led them to invent the, the math we use today. That came next. Science as we know it today, came ab about uh, 400 years ago. So, anybody here know how long our strain of humans has been on the planet? How long have we been here? This is it's kind of important, isn't it? For context. So do you know about, so it happens that we inherit more from our mother than our father because Mitochondria and its DNA don't fit into sperm, but they do fit into ova. And so when we get a fertilized egg, we can not only get the union of the two um, nuclear DNAs, but we also get the female mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondria are little bacteria that were captured a long time ago to help with energy production in cells. They were originally separate organisms. So it turns out you can actually run computer simulations on the amount of change in the female line of humanity. Should do this sometime because it's kind of interesting. And it turns out that if you run it back, we are all de de descended from one female. Now, of course, there were other females around back then, but that female lived 192,000 years ago. So our particular strain of humanity has been here for about 192,000 years. Think about that. We only invented science 400 years ago. That's how dumb we are. Think about it. That's why IQ doesn't count. We never were smart enough to invent science. We blundered around amusing ourselves with stories for hundreds of thousands of years. So, almost everybody in these fields winds up doing a combination of them. You kind of want to be in the sweet spot. You want to do a little tinkering, a little engineering, a little math, a little science. And really the difference between the fields is more of temperament than the kinds of things that you learn. Some people are idealists, some are pragmatists. Now if we look at computing, <laughs> it's mostly tinkering, a little bit of engineering, maybe a little math, hardly any science. And when we say engineering, we don't mean real engineering. Real engineering, Empire State Building in New York was built in less than a year by less than 3,000 people, including dem dem uh, demolishing the original site and occupancy. So it was built at the rate of two stories a day. The steel was still 110 degrees, 40 degrees centigrade, when it came from the factories in Pittsburgh to make the Empire State Building. That's engineering. So whatever it is we do is like maybe what Egyptians did, making pyramids, piling things on top of each other. But in computing, we could not organize 3,000 people to do a major thing in less than a year, right? Have you ever heard of it? Ever? No. So if you take the word engineering seriously, and I do, I don't mean it as a metaphor. I'm saying engineering, let's not 
do away with what engineering has meant the last three or four thousand years. If we take that word seriously, we haven't got it yet in software. We really don't know how to do it. Okay, so this is my favorite hairball. It's actually from a woolly mammoth. So it's a big hairball. Um, I'm going to get rid of it because, but you can think of it as something complicated. I'm going to replace it with stars because they're nicer to look at. But if you think of, we're given this phenomena, it's the basic thing. It could be a hairball, it could be, they're all abstractly hairballs. And what we want to do is make sense of it in science. And we have language, which is computer scientists, you know, can all be made out of the operation NAND or NOR which actually invented by a guy by the name of Charles Peirce in the 19th century. So we can make all things having to do with language out of that one operation. And what we want to do is to come up with something in language that closely mimics, mim mimics the phenomena that we're interested in. And in fact, because of the, the limitations of our brain, that's about as far as we can go, because the brain contains various kinds of languages that does not contain stars. And so we're interested in the relationships between those. So the reason I'm explaining this is because when I ask graduate students in the United States what is their meaning of computer science, they always give me an engineering definition, which implies that they have no idea what the word science actually means. This is what it means. But science doesn't care whether nature made it or whether humans made it. So we can take a bridge, do exactly the same thing, make a t-shirt. Explains how this bridge works and what's cool about engineering is once you make that t-shirt, you can make another bridge. Get those engineers to make more interesting bridge for a scientist to look at. And you can take this rather far. This is my favorite bridge in Japan, longest suspension bridge in the world. And to give you an idea of how big it is, there's the Great Pyramid of Egypt and the Empire State Building next to it. So it, its towers are actually the size of uh, the greatest building created in the early 30s. This is some kind of bridge. Makes you feel good to be an engineer. At least it makes me feel good because this is, you know, the ability to really make engineering and science harmonize with each other. There's no greater music. So computing. We've got computers, we've got software. Here's John McCarthy. He can put the abstraction of all that stuff on a t-shirt. That's the Lisp interpreter in itself one of my favorite things from more than 50 years ago, 1958. If you don't have a little tear in your eye when you look at that, you're missing something really, really important about our field. This is like one of the greatest things that it's ever done because the same thing with the bridge. Once somebody does that, man, you can start inventing things that are much more, you can invent computer things that are like, uh, like living things and make internets and so forth. So this is really cool stuff. And you can also look at personal computing and ask how many t-shirts. We had an Empire State Building worth of code from Microsoft, but we should ask how many t-shirts does it really take. And so one of the things that we have done in our approach is Finding that problem difficult, it's really hard to think this thing through because, geez, we were immersed in this stuff. It looks large. It's complicated. So what you can do is make a little Frankenstein's monster of a system. It isn't the one you actually want exactly, but it's kind of cute and it's kind of scary. And if it's also kind of small, then you've actually made the thing that will allow you to think about this other 
guy and enable you to make a baby step towards capturing millions of lines of code in a few tens of thousands of lines of code. And so that's one of the things we've been doing. So my website, the website of Viewpoints Research Institute is vpri.org and there you will read more about this project and I'll just show you one example here from a bunch of principles one will be the math wins one tiny model T t-shirt programming and a little bit of particles and fields so this is one of uh, our colleagues Dan Amelang and he was charged with the goal of doing all of the computer graphics that you see on a personal computer. And so, uh, so that's several millions of lines of code. For instance, we took Cairo as an example. Cairo is the rendering system and com composing system that's used by Firefox. So it does most of the graphical tricks, a few million lines of code. And it turns out Dan has a mother and his mother is a high school geometry teacher and she asked him well what are you doing son a few years ago and he told her and they sat down didn't come back to work sat down between Thanksgiving and Christmas and worked out a new way of thinking about the involvement of arbitrary polygons with pixels in math and it looks like this so this is the formula they came up with so with that this is without any super sampling or anything else like that you just execute do what that formula says and it will give you the exact shading for perfect anti-aliasing. So, now of course you can't run that formula. So the next thing he did was to make up a language that was rather like this mathematical language but which was executable. So you can think of this as a domain specific language although it's fairly general and it has math in it, it's stream based it's highly par parallel and so forth and these the 40 lines of math over here comes out to be about 80 lines of runnable code now you can run it and you get something like this so the rendering part will render uh, high quality characters and simple shading and and so forth like that so so that's 80 lines of code and of course there's more features and Dan also has a brother and his brother is very good at math also so he and Dan one summer uh, made up the 26 standard compositing rules that are used in Cairo and all of them together was about 90 lines of code because right? if you think about it if you don't worry about optimization or anything else like that the mathematics here in the right kind of language it just falls out you're actually writing down what a mathematician would write down as the actual relationships and you get each one of these things does a different compositing there's the rendering stuff sampling for making pictures pen stroking so the total today is a little bit under 400 because we added a few more features to it but basically all of the graphics that we're used to in 2D on a personal computer can be done in under 400 lines of code. Okay, that is a big difference compared to maybe one or two millions of lines of code in Cairo. Like you can look at all of it. 400 lines of code is just a few pages. Well, there's a hitch. And I'm going to end this talk with just telling you how we get rid of it. The hitch, of course, is you have to make this language run. Right? So you don't want to spend three years, you don't come up with the perfect language and then spend three years trying to get it run. So you have to have another language. And this is based out of a paper from 1964 about how to make the world's simplest uh, compiler compiler done by a guy at, at uh, UCLA, Val Shorey. And we did a modern version of that. Here's Alex Worth who did it. And so the parser for making the graphics language is 130 lines of this language which is called Ometa and the 
uh, the optimizer and the compiler to a language like C is another 700 some odd lines. So that's what it takes to make the graphics language. So it's a little bit larger, but the nice thing about this compiler compiler language is you use it for each of the domain specific languages that you're making things from. And of course you have to make that language. But what's nice about it, it can make itself and it can make itself in only 76 lines of code and it can optimize itself in 30 lines of code. So you get the idea here? Right, so the idea here is that each problem space has a particularly felicitous point of view. Point of view is worth 80 IQ points. If you find that point of view, you're going to be able to write down the relationships more or less directly. And that helps you think about the problem you're working on. And then if it's easy to make that domain specific language you just came up with run, you're in business because all of a sudden you've got a system that's actually that's actually working. So I'm gonna so we're out of time here, and uh, I think I'll leave you with that. I was gonna I think it's more than enough information, but this is I think one of the points here that's interesting is that this idea um, is not only not new today. That's why they're called DSLs today. It's a term we have today. Turns out this idea was in full flower 50 years ago. Nobody knows about it today because the, the terms change. It was, they were called problem-oriented languages 50 years ago, POLs. And for a variety of reasons, this whole technique of making software systems very quickly and very t in small form got dropped when the commercialization of personal computing happened in the early 80s. Note, it's not taught as a, as a major technique, and very few kids in the United States know that it's easy to make a compiler-compiler language that is much more general and much easier to use than, say, Yak. So you learn Yak, and you're convinced that it is hard to make a language, but in fact, Yak is bad. The actual techniques of making a language are actually much easier to do. So, uh, let me leave you with this idea that whatever it is that we think we know today, uh, we should shut it off periodically and see if we can find other things to learn about. Thank you.